have two. Uh, with this story concerning Sylvia. All right, let's get right into it then. I'm trying to do a video at the same time, not wake up my grandchild. So bear with me. You know, like I said earlier, in part one, your early years are basically pretty much what shapes and forms your opinion about your neighborhood, about people, um, your perception of the world. A lot of that is directly, uh, you know, intertwined with your environment. And so I tell you a lot about the neighborhood I grew up in which was in the early 60s, the 60s and 70s, basically. And I talk about Sylvia, because um, Sylvia was a real, she was just a real beacon of life for me as a little child. I would, again, have the opportunity to go in the backyard with her, um, O.C. White, and Dr. Bob. For those of y'all in Milwaukee who remember, and they would be jamming, they would be playing all kinds of music, and there would be all kinds of stars or people that would come into town, and they would end up over their house, like people like Billy Eckstein or Nat Cole, um, just anybody you can possibly think of. I didn't know who these people were, but my parents would get super excited sometimes when they would peek out the back door and see who was there and they would do live broadcasts for the radio. But like I said before, most of our neighbors were white and, and you know, we all went to the neighborhood schools. Either you went to Victor Berger, you went to Robert Fulton for middle school, you went to Riverside or North Division for high school. East Division is what they called it. It was North, South, East, and West. We lived on the East Side. It's now since been renamed Riverside. And Robert Fulton was the middle school. So most of the kids that went there, all the schools were kids that were neighborhood students. And yes, we did have white children in our neighborhood school. For instance, um, I speak a lot about young men just being drafted and just disappearing out of the neighborhoods. And these were people that you knew, you know, your friends, brothers, cousins, and neighbors. You just wake up one day and you go, well, where's so and so? Oh, yeah, he got drafted. Or oh, he going to war. He going to war. He going to now. And it was such a part of my existence that I look at how ungrateful and how spoiled that this generation is that doesn't even know just the the, the gall, the unmitigated gall of this country to draft somebody and make them go and fight in the war they didn't start. So, well, that's a whole other story. I'm not going to go there. But because my existence is different, and I grew up in a pretty much socialist neighborhood. I told you I had a mayor that lived a couple blocks up the street from me. Um, there's a, a lot of priests and Jesuits that would encourage us to play basketball or come to the church to do certain things. My brother got a parochial school education. Um, I went to one of the best schools here. Um, because of the Jesuits that would walk the streets in their little brown robes. I guess that's what they were called. And then we had the nuns who had the full regalia because we lived right a block, two blocks away from St. Elizabeth. Um, and so when I think about people like Tommy, who was a, a white kid, who was Basically, as I think about it, he, he, his mother was single. She worked. Um, he wasn't racist. I mean, black kids went over their house and ate and Tommy came over your house and ate. Um, he ended up having a, a child with my 
one of my cousin's friends. Um, can I say that Tommy is, is a racist? I wouldn't dare say that. Tommy grew up in the hood with me. He he knows me. He knows us. And the only thing that's different about Tommy is his skin color. And there was a few people in my neighborhood like that. Um, one of my brothers, the one that's right over me, uh, had developed a good friend with a young man named Kerry. He since passed away. And it was real cool because my brother is real quiet. He had another friend named Benji. Benji and um, uh, and Kerry. I think Benji was on the racist side because see we learned these things growing up. Who were the kids that, that didn't like? And so it didn't matter because my father didn't really care too much for white kids. So we knew these things growing up, but it didn't stop our relationships either. It did or it didn't. And I thought it was really horrible because when the riots start, the hood wanted my brother to take a side. And they wanted him to beat up Carrie. And they all gathered around and he was trying to make my brother, and he couldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. My brother has since gone on to become the, uh, <laughs> he, he since had gone on to become a, a, a Golden Glove champion, so nobody was trying to make him do anything after that. But I'm just saying, these things shape your existence. And I had to take a break with Sylvia, and I, I want to start right here because you guys have got to get this book, and it's called Sister, an African American um, Life in Search of Justice. Okay, and it was written by Joey LePage, and I want to encourage each and every one of you to go and get this book. You will, won't be disappointed. I want to see if I can send a copy uh, over to Yvette Carnell at Breaking Brown and get um because this is it's it's all encompassed on the stuff she we talk about and she talks about in terms of black politics and what did the baby boomers do because they didn't do anything and I think this right here encompasses why I think that we should not blame ourselves and blame other people because we don't like the outcome and other than that I don't have a complaint with Yvette Carnell that's one of the biggest uh, things I disagree with her and uh, her philosophy um, people like Sylvia people I knew that grew up people I know that gave their life people I know that right now that are in mental institutions or sitting back somewhere hoarding because they gave everything they had to liberation and to call them sellouts or to call them problems now that you on the scene is a total travesty and disingenuous and I reject it and I reject you when you start talking like that because I know right there that's that's ignorance and it's sheer ignorance that will make you say something like that so let me continue on because I want you to hear what Sylvia had to say. I'm skipping a little bit because there's a neighbor, uh, six, uh, a part where she gets directly to my neighborhood and her buying a plane in my neighborhood, a, a plane, a house. Um, here we go. Uh, most of my neighbors treated me all right. I had one white person across the street from me. A very nice woman. And the Stein Hoffels were on the corner. For those of y'all who live here, you know about the Stein Hoffels. They are a really big furniture store here. They was nice people. Uh, very nice. Very religious. They wasn't poor. Um, they had their furniture store on 3rd and something. There was a police living right next door to me. A young guy. His mother, I have to say, though, she hated black people. I really believe the people who sold me the home sold it to me because they wanted to put somebody next to her who was a different race as a way of them getting back at her. Mrs. Park was her name. <laughs> she hated black people. Oh, she despised black people. You can't even you couldn't even walk on the other side of your house 
to put your storm windows up unless she was and she, unless she was calling the cops on you. You couldn't park in front of her house because uh, you taking up her uh, space. We had one married. If you got company, you know how that is. A big Christmas deal or something. Well, she could insult your company. She could really hurt your feelings. Her son was in the police department way before my brother got killed. So I wonder sometimes, does this have anything to do with it? I speak to him. Sometimes he would speak, sometimes he wouldn't. His mom, she was just nasty. We were right there, neck to neck. It wasn't easy living there with those folks. Wow. We had bought a piece of property where there was a back house and a front house. One person owned the back. This is T. TC. This is T. I'm sorry. Deal or something like that. She was white, but a really nice person. Her building was right on the alley. I had the building in the front. She would always walk through my property to get to the street. Her son picked her up all over the time. Her son could park on the street anywhere, and that was okay with Mrs. Parks next door. But for me, I had to really park in my stay in your place. That's the way they say, stay in your place. I lived with that, with her. There were arguments, me and her. And the cops would come out and the police came out a number of times and they couldn't find anything wrong with what I was doing. I would just tell them, well, what am I supposed to do? Sell my place and get out of here? That was very hard living with them. And them white folks over there was torture. Wow. That was right here in Milwaukee. This was in the 50s during the times when Reverend Martin Luther King and Rosie Parks was having all that trouble in the South. They had started down there with the bus thing. But I experienced more segregation, more downgrading black people in Wisconsin than I really, honestly, to God, this is true facts. There is a lot of downgrading in this in the South. But to me, I really didn't come in contact with it as much as I did in the North. They don't let black people in their neighborhoods if they can keep them out anywhere. They don't want you there. You better understand that. They'll burn you out, set the fire. They didn't do that to me. But they did do it to some blacks in them days. Me, I only had trouble with Mrs. Park. She was just determined to get me out of there. And I did leave before she did. Now, Mr. Steinhofer sold his home on the corner. That was later. He sold his home to a black woman. Then we had a few more blacks moving in. The blacks are moving in to my neighborhood. And the whites are moving out. And when blacks start moving in, the police department moved in. Before that, they did have a little police department further down on Hadley, which was just an old house or something. It was like a village police department. But when black people start moving in, they throwed up that big Locust Street Police Department building. Ooh, that was just, what is it? All of this. This is quite a police department here but blacks are moving in and that's why they started to say you cannot park black people couldn't park in front of their own home their own property we poor blacks could hardly afford to pay our telephone or light or gas bill and now we gotta worry about this we got another bill on us listen to this event you gotta pay for a permit to park in front of your own home I did a couple of videos about this a couple of years ago. I had lived there for all those years with them white folks. And honest to God, it, you didn't have to have a permit. I worked out in Whitefish Bay, Fox Point, and places like that. 
them police is out there did not bother you about no ticket. I'd go out there, I'd stay all night long. I'd say, but my car. Ugh, you ain't gotta get no ticket. You ain't gonna get no ticket out here. You wasn't gonna get no ticket for what? Parking? But down here where I live, you would. When the blacks move in, the whites move out. Then they make you pay. They make you pay for parking in front of your own house. When you're paying taxes, I couldn't understand it. So I got into a big argument. They gave me a ticket for parking in front of my house. So you had to get up in the middle of the night to move your car. This is this still this practice goes on right here to this day. You had to park on the even side of the street or the odd side of the street. If you don't, you're subject to a thirty dollar ticket. Okay? You can park on the streets of Milwaukee between the hours of certain times, um, but between 2 and 6 a.m., you can't park on the street. So you have to get up out of your bed and move your car if you don't want to get the ticket. And you have to have one of those permits to park on the streets so you, if you don't have a driveway. Just sad. It's, it's, it's just saying how they do us. And now, because this is another example of redlining and doing things to people that white people don't have a clue to what they're doing. And if they do, they have no compassion for it. They don't care about it. Um, when blacks move in, the whites move out. They make you pay paper parking in front of your own house when you pay taxes. I can't understand it. So I got into a big argument. They gave me a ticket for parking in front of my house. Again, you had to get up in the middle of the night and move your car. I did not have a garage to put it in. So I got this ticket. I got this bill. Three or four dollars. Could have been less. <laughs> yeah. Parking ticket. I didn't pay it. And then this one police came to knock on my door to tell me that I owed this ticket. He says, Miss White. I say, what? He says, you owe a ticket, and I'm here to arrest you, or you pay this ticket. I say, well, I really don't have no money, so the only thing I can do is accept the arrest. He says, you're making a bad name for yourself, and stuff like that. I says, well, that's all I did. I ain't kill nobody. I ain't murder somebody. I be, if I did that, then I'd be making a bad name for myself. I say. But I ain't making no bad name for myself by going to jail for a ticket. You gotta be kidding. He's telling me that. How stupid can you get? This is how they talk to us. I says, mister, I don't have no money to pay this ticket. And I have a child. What can I do? Set in jail? For a ticket? Because it's a couple of days in jail, you know. He said, oh no, you just have to pay the ticket. You just call up your friends and your family or somebody to help you pay it. I says, well, my family don't have anything either. So how can I call and ask them to pay for a ticket? Oh, him and I, we had such a go and go about that ticket. I said, I'll just go to jail for the ticket. Can I bring my little boy in there with me? Or you going to send him to school? He goes to school right on the chamber, right up the street there. He says, ma'am, you got to pay. I said, I don't got no money. I'll just sit in jail. So then he says, should I call the wagon? I said, no. You don't have to call the wagon. I'll just walk down there. That's how close it was to my house. And like I told you, I'm hop, skipping the jump from the police department. And all this crime and heroin selling goes on. Um, but they cleaning it up. And you can bet it's not for people that look like me. Okay, because they want this prime area back. Um, they got a new Bradley, a new uh, Bradley Center, a new arena. Uh, there is no way. I am five minutes from downtown. Five minutes. That give me chance to talk to you some more. Make me this offer. We walking down there, fussing all the way, because I was teed off. When he pushed the door open. And me and him was walking in. He says to the other man there, you got a doozy here. And I said, 
I'm no doozy. I'm Sylvia White. They all white. You ain't got no black in this office at all. I says, this man picked me up. He come to my house to arrest me for a ticket. And oh, I started. Oh, did I start in that place? I says, I do not have money. I do have a child to support. He's at school, but he'll be home pretty soon. And he would have been home pretty he would have been home pretty soon, I said. I said, what we going to do? Because I do not have the money. I said, I won't have a little change until I get paid. And that's about two weeks. Then the man said, well, I'm going to take you back there and lock you up. I said, yeah, do that. Or do something so I can get this ticket over with. And you going to see about my child? I have a child that he, he's in school you going to see about him? Because if I stay in jail, girl, I bring so much sand in there with that officer. I says, the minute black people move in, y'all start giving tickets. I've been living here for many years, and nobody got a ticket for parking on the street. So many years, they never gave a ticket in that neighborhood because I was there. I was the only black person on that block. Now, I have a black neighbor, and then I have another black neighbor across the street over this direction. And the minute black people move in the neighborhood, this is what y'all do. I say, what I need to do is call the NAACP or somebody, but I'll call my brother and see if he can bail me out. He says, well, call your brother. Then I remember. My brother ain't home. He's working. I just have to go to jail. I'll sit because I don't have no money. This other man sitting in the office heard me. He was sitting back there in the next room. He said, come here, Miss White. I go in there and I say, yeah. He says, give, give me the ticket. I said, okay. And he changed it. He discarded it or he did something to it. But see, I didn't do what I should have really done. I should have done what I should have done was went to see somebody to, to see who could stop some of this giving tickets in the neighborhood. Not just my ticket. What I should have done was really called the NAACP or somebody because I knew what was going on with Martin Luther King in them. I knew what was coming up, that black people was, well, just being mistreated. Okay. There's so much in this story that I want to get into. And it shapes, again, my thinking. Um, it thinks it, it, it shapes um, pretty much what was going on at this time because all of this is going to be leading up to the riots. And remember, at this time, as I was still a little kid, I remember Otis and Sister White and all of them. They used to go to, of course, to the same church, and she was not related to Sylvia, by the way. Uh, but her sons used to carry me home. Who ended up being part of the Milwaukee Three who shot the police and during this 1967 riot. Um, we were friends with that family. My mom and her were very good friends. We all went to church together. And like I said, one of her sons was one of the people that was responsible for killing the police during that time, during the riot, and we all wore t-shirts to free him. He eventually did get out of jail, um, but again, my memory doesn't serve me really well because um, such a long time ago, but these are people who shaped my life. Um, you know, I, I can't even, I, I got to pay homage 
to some of these people because it was them fighting for the little things that made it even a possibility for me to be saying and, and doing what I'm saying right now. But we never could get this ticket thing rectified. But I think it's time that it, it is revisited. And I think it is time that if whatever kind of color district that they're doing in your city and in your state, because they're doing something. They're over-policing it, of course. They're doing all these things so we can end up in the prison industrial complex, end up continuously in debt, continue living black life is hard. And they want it just that way. They want to keep us off balance. And anybody who doesn't agree with that, fuck them. You got no reason to even entertain them or what they think because you know what is being done to us is not an illusion. And again, I'm going to encourage y'all, please go get this book. Sylvia Bell White. Well, the book is called Sister, an African American Life in Search of Justice. And the premise and the basis of the book, um, it's a Wisconsin study in um, racism, but the basis of this book is about her brother also and her journey coming up from the South and uh, uh, her brother being killed by the police and then having a weapon planted in his hands. And y'all need to see it. It's going to touch on everything that y'all touch and we talk about with the, a breaking brown family in terms of color of law. In terms of redistricting, redlining, uh, black politics, it's right here in this book. So I'm going to encourage y'all, please, sister, an African-American life in search of justice. Okay? Thank y'all for y'all time. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being out there. And um, I'm going to be back a little later because we're going to talk about it. But that's the Sylvia section. Bye-bye.